<laughs> thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I will also play a mark. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's really amazing to be in a room with my dear people. So uh, I'm trying to manage my anxiousness by focusing on that part of this. <laughs> uh, so uh, thanks everyone for being here. Education events. This is on racial disparities and law enforcement traffic stops. Um, two quick notes of clarification or more logistics. Uh, if you have to pop out, of course, that's okay. Bathroom breaks, etc. Tight room. Sorry for those before. Thanks for coming. Um, and then uh, clarifying questions only if you can during the um, talk, and then we'll have 15, 20, probably 20, 25 extra questions. So I want to start with my thank yous. Um, I found writing the acknowledgments chapter of my dissertation really personally inspired and talking about the input which I've been uh, to have so much support over so many years. Um, for my Buddhist practice, we typically think of taking refuge in our teachers, their teachings, and our community. So I likewise first thought about my typical teachers and mentors. Uh, my mom, who's here from North Carolina, New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Last year, I who was a surrogate father in many ways from my childhood, Steve Kaufman. For the last 15 years of my practice, Tama Oken and Cal Allen, who were powerful mentors to me in my family and recent education. Um, Dr. G, during my engineering days, Scott Freshville of the state, um, Scott, um, who I've worked with for many years, and then Steve Wing, uh, being the Justice Foundation, and my uh, me all the training, and who I miss regularly. Uh, and special thanks to my committee. So, Steve, Charlie, Whitney, and Frank and Paul. Um, Frank's helped lead me into this research and practice, uh, starting my first year program, generally. I came so much from I'm excited the new relationship with Paul, um, but not the end of the relationship, I hope. So. Uh, I'm excited about working in health and space together. And so thank you to the committee. Uh, and a very special thanks to my epidemiology report my community on Steve and Charlie Whitney, who supported me in uh, over many in many ways over many years, but for me uh, and my questions in this research during and outside class. Um, and they've all been incredibly generous with their time. So really thank you. Uh, and then specific to the study, um, we couldn't make it today. I'd like to acknowledge the members of the Orange County Bias Street Policing Task Force that I uh, sit on, um, that I've worked with many years now, and the lawyers of the Southern Force for Social Justice, um, who've also helped us work in this So, uh, Barry Bruston, uh, a black gay Quaker organizer from the civil rights era from the use of organizing around uh, education about organizing the 63rd March in Washington where he, Dr. Martin Luther King, and others spoke about racial and economic justice. Among uh, his many other quotes, Barry Russell said, we need in every community a group of angelic troublemakers. And I'm so thankful to my community of intelligent, powerful, justice-minded friends. Uh, so thanks in particular to my partner, Margo, for a uh, decade of support and sharing my aimless practice with me, and his brother, Tom, for growing up alongside me and leaving me. Thanks to Todd and Carmen, uh, who drove up in South Carolina. Uh, two of my oldest and most consistent friends, both uh, inspiring professors themselves. And lastly, thanks to Steve's fellow troublemakers, uh, Libby, Danielle, and Adrian in particular, and there are others. Um, I'm regularly so thankful to have met you. a lot to me in this program, but uh, I think you're my favorite part. I look forward to getting into future trouble with you. Uh, and lastly, a brief uh, thank you to the practices and lineages that sustain me, many of which started feeding me as a child and still feeding me now. Um, they help carry me through the program, even though they're not the same person. So, on to the content. Uh, a brief outline of what I'll talk about today first. Um, after a background on traffic stops and public health, we'll dig into my two main aims. So, aim one is concerned with the accurate measurements of traffic stops and their disparities by race ethnicity in these agencies here in North Carolina. Um, there, we'll focus on access, volume, and multi agency driving factors. Aim two is the evaluation of a specific intervention in Fayetteville, North Carolina, to reduce motor vehicle crashes and racial ethnic disparities in traffic stops. There, we'll focus on separating uh, traffic stops by their type. And after a bit of interpretation, particularly uh, using the public health critical race practices, we'll move into discussion and hopefully plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, there's a big uh, chunk of my references, uh, with notes for clearing my number. I also left the two of the most important ones to me. Um, as textual references mm -hmm. in a year in case you just write them down. And I'm leaving uh, uh, 50 slides in the supplementary analysis part of the end. <laughs> 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 I was told to get 30 minutes, which I won't, but I'll leave for a solid goodbye. Um, but if you have questions, I have to take that. Uh, sorry about the breadth and depth balance of my work. 
Okay, let's get started with some background. Um, so I'd like to start with a coincidental personal story that I think succinctly captures many of the dynamics of play my best. I started this project in my first semester, that's fall of 2014, five years ago. Uh, uh, change. And I'm happy to elaborate, you know, again during question period on how that happened. But by 2017, I've been keeping track of every single trip exactly uh, with GPS for that's every turn I could drive to better understand driving the uh, You'll see those 1,300 trips in the bottom right. Uh, I'm happy to elaborate on that somewhere else during question before we talk about that. Uh, but that year I received one ticket, which is a blue dot uh, in South Carolina there. Uh, and that's the only one I've received since, which you see is not in the um, I received that ticket in the Clemson, South Carolina Business Department. And important to this story, that ticket was for speeding after leaving a state highway and entering into town. And as you'll see by the end of the defense, again, this is some of the privileged experience, um, but I admit I was a little annoyed uh, since I thought I was pulled over a speed trap. Uh, but the annoyance washed away when I saw the back of the, of the traffic stop ticket, which I thought was a fantastic addition to my defense. So I'm very excited to gather <laughs> this quote. Uh, the, the primary aim, the primary aim of traffic stop enforcement, traffic law enforcement, is to reduce traffic accidents, injuries, and deaths through fair, impartial, and reasonable enforcement of traffic laws in South Carolina traffic scenarios. So I'd like to flag, flag a few things that we start this uh, from that The primary aim of reducing motor vehicle injuries, fair, impartial, and reasonable. The location of uh, South Carolina, uh, all three points of the NRS laws communication. So, relatedly, what assurances do we have that stops are fair, impartial, and reasonable? How do we assess that? How do we attribute driver risk to you knowing North Carolina driver going to South Carolina, uh, you know, driving far away? How primary is the aim of reducing traffic accidents, injuries, and deaths? And can that aim be more central? That is, um, but perhaps a more central question are traffic stops public health related? Yeah. <laughs> um, I received some pushback on this, um, you know, not many in this room, but I think it's a, it's a reasonable question if you think um, public health is primarily infectious disease. Um, you know, that doesn't really scale. So um, I think this has a simple answer, but we're going to complicate this some. Um, I think any modern definition of public health that acknowledges social ideology or any upstream factors or anything other than material physical harms, though there are those who help the So there's a resounding yes. So we're looking at those two frames. From a conventional frame, traffic stops are an evidence-based intervention, um, which I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna publicize that some, but they're an evidence-based intervention for some kinds of motor vehicle crash outcomes, notably crash prevention and injury severity reduction, for instance, by increasing sea levels. They are also conventionally linked to other injury and health outcomes, like public safety and crime, though that evidence is weaker and not much I found on those ones. But conventionally, we link them to those kind of public health policies. Uh, and so regardless of evidence, the conventional frame suggests multiple ones between traffic stops and public health. From a more critical frame, traffic stops produce public health related outcomes uh, under a more anti-racist and social epidemiology conform frame. So as we'll cover, traffic stops are a major entry to the justice system, which has documented disparities on almost every level from citations to the death level. Public health is called to respond to anti-racist positions and disparities. Uh, making traffic stops a place for action and surveillance of these barriers. Further, any epidemiology that concedes of health against more than the absence of disease, which we should, um, should be concerned with more social factors like loss of public trust, justice involvement at all, extraction of communities, uh, extraction from communities of wealth into government coffers, and bodies into jail and prison And most violently, traffic stops are a direct path to other injustices. So while you've likely heard of that's one arm black and white police, you may not know how central traffic stops are in many of those stories. So Walter Scott was shot to death in the back after a traffic stop to a non-functioning breakdown. Lendo Castillo, killed uh, three years to almost a day, was pulled over 40 times in the last few years, and a few years up to his death, for reasons including speeding, driving without a muffler, and not wearing a seatbelt. Sandra Bland, an unarmed black woman who died in jail after a routine traffic stop, and multiple other unpaid traffic stops. Uh, tickets at the time of arrest, including operating the vehicle without a license and lack of insurance. So while police shootings are you know, an extreme and much rarer uh, occurrence than traffic stops are, which are extremely instant, um, they represent one of the most, uh, one of a number of compounding experiences with their own disparities that traffic stops um, put someone uniquely at risk. So contrast those experiences, for instance, being pulled over 40 times in a few years with modern. So I don't know what those experiences are. 
So given the relevance of public health, which are the important points of background before we dig into the work. Um, first, traffic stops are the most instant interaction with law enforcement. So around 9% pull over every year. And uh, as a reminder, that global average can be very different in different areas. Um, second, law enforcement have wide, I would even say the widest latitude in application of traffic stops. So two Supreme Court cases in particular, Terry v. Ohio and Ren v. U.S., provide almost limitless discretion to escalate an actual or suspected violation as small as moving a little bit of lane um, into, a, into a traffic stop. Lastly, preliminary analysis suggests, like most other law enforcement outcomes, large disparities in stops themselves and consequent outcomes of searches, citations, arrests. Um, that said, many traffic stop rates are based on residential populations, which create problems. Um, and that problem is by aim one. So on to my dissertation's aims. As mentioned, there are fundamental challenges in measuring stop rates, uh, traffic stop rates, reliable. Um, so aim one is to create a travel-based stop rate for North Carolina law enforcement agencies and describe the direction and extent of change in measures of disparity when we better account for uh, disparities and uh, differences in travel factors instead of using residential rates. And aim two, again, um, is an intervention in Fayetteville, the design to provide motor vehicle fatalities and reduce traffic stops period. They'll rely on being one's um, lessons from how to measure traffic stops. A side aim was to explore the utility of CRT and uh, critical race theory and public health and public praxis in um, discussion of public health and traffic stops. So we'll revisit that side aim in discussion of what kind of work Okay, so a little bit more localized background. So why study these questions in North Carolina? North Carolina has one of the oldest and most complete traffic stop data sets in the nation, 22 million traffic stops since 2002, preliminary, uh, making a near census of traffic stops. Preliminary analyses suggest disparities exist and are worth better documenting here in North Carolina. Uh, there's also uh, a coalition of partners working on traffic stops here in our state for some time. It's a partnership with the NAACP, Southern Coalition for Social Justice, and more um, progressive uh, police departments help to ground what might be a sort of more outsider study in the practice realities uh, of making traffic stops in the So on to the data. The primary data set is the North Carolina SBI traffic stop database from 2002 to 2017. We're going to look at that data set in more detail in a minute. But both games one and two give multiple supplemental data sets as well. Uh, side note, if your dissertation requires as many data sets, you're asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> So most central though to both those games is the 2017 National Household Travel Survey. It's done every uh, 10 years, two to a month, is more. No, uh, nearly every 10 years. Um, and also the 20, uh, 2020 census, the interdecile ACS, um, vehicle crash data from the US, or USC Highway Safety Research Center, and index and violent crime events from uh, SBI uniform crime reporting, UCR to uh, the US FBI. Those will be used in the interview. Okay, so back to the North Carolina traffic stop data sets for the main data set question. In the left column, we see demographics of those pulled over uh, by number and percent. And on the right, we see the North Carolina population. Now, acknowledging, you know, AIM 1, which is limitations of residential comparisons, um, the subject of AIM 1 again, um, note the apparent portion of representation provided. So, this is um, black folks make up 31% of this data set in terms of traffic stops and 21% of the population. Let's start digging into measurement of traffic stops and disparities. Okay. So, when you're studying uh, consequent outcomes to stops, like searches or citations, you benefit from a consistent denominator. You know the number of people who were stopped, and you're interested in searches after stops, citations after stops, arrests after stops. Um, but, standard practice for the traffic stops themselves, to build rates using resident populations. But you know there be flaws since residents and driver populations are very different. Um, deciding, figuring out exactly how different they are uh, is one of the This practice is confusingly called benchmarking. Um, in the literature, I'm not going to refer to it that way here, just on flag that if you're looking at criminal justice literature, this is called benchmarking. Um, so some alternatives have been proposed, but all the flaws. Survey data has been used. For instance, that's where the previous estimate of 1 in 10 being stopped a year come from. Um, but uh, a survey is going to rely on good response rates and isn't a true census of stops. Others propose more complicated combined metrics using other data. So, for instance, 
comparing uh, traffic stops to not at fault accident rates with the idea that they would be both based on the same denominator of driver or vehicle traffic. Um, but then the uh, determining fault is not always easy or available to data sets from one. And then two, the metrics you come up with, like one paper suggests an odds ratio of like a, one, a risk of traffic stop over a percent of traffic stops versus a percent of non fault and an odds ratio of two different constructs. It's exactly the odds ratio, maybe, but what is even that? How do you interpret that? How do you use that? Um, didn't become very confusing. Um, particularly odd, I want to flag as uh, is this third one here RTI star and the veil of darkness. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, that approach for assessing disparities, you subset all the stops before and after sundown and consider whether drivers are, are consider whether officer stop rates change by race ethnicity when it supposedly can't see driver skin color. And that's the frame um, of assessing racial disparities of traffic stops. You're subsetting all the data time measures. But um, so this is a tunnel vision view of racial disparities and structural racism, focusing on implicit and explicit interpersonal bias only and, and the uh, sort of phenotype version of race. It's very, very interesting. So you can saturate a black neighborhood with stops all day long. And as long as you do the same during the day and night, you will pass this test. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, so uh, that said, many agencies fail the test. But, but just to say that this is also in literature and the way that we conceive of race as a thing that happens only between the driver and the law enforcement officer. So lastly, uh, here, papers have suggested pro rating residents and drivers by adjustment factors, like using citations, um, place of residence. When you have that, um, North Carolina doesn't have a spot to record the um, place of residence of the driver, which is why we have a problem in the fucking part. Um, and then using something like inverse distance weighting of the driver miles. So you live here, we're going to distribute your driver miles like this in this case, um, which is better than nothing. Um, but inverse distance weighting isn't based on real data about driving drivers. Right? It's, um, many things work that way, but, but it's a really rough approximation. And um, this last point is what we'll be doing in, uh, in one, um, using real data from a survey, trying to transform residents into drivers. How are we going to do that? So uh, for Dell, Dell uh, identifies six factors at play when considering traffic stop rates. She makes no distinction though between accurate measurements of the rate and other factors that may explain higher low rates. So for instance, like uh, rationale. So, um, she suggests considering differences in risky driving behaviors. Um, that might be a good thing to compare against the stop rate, but not the substance of the stop rate itself. And that's not the practice in other injury based literature when you're considering you know, a stop, uh, you know, some sort of seatbelt inducing rate. Um, so, again, that'd be something you can compare against accurate stop rates, but not a factor to include the measurement of it. So, instead, I'm going to focus on three factors here uh, different by race ethnicity, access to vehicles. The volume of driving total and the driving uh, reality between agency jurisdictions and not just driving the job. So let's look at some national literature first on differences in these factors. So, on access, income disparities, among other factors, lead to differences by race, ethnicity, and access to people. So, a prior national study, uh, this is now almost 20 years ago, uh, but from the same survey, found that four out of five white and Hispanic households, only half of black and Hispanic households, had access to people. Uh, that's stark, a stark difference that would change, you know, if you're considering rates based on that um, moving, uh, moving from residents to drivers. That's the okay, that's national level. On volume, job commuting, spacious spread of activities that they were living, cost of car maintenance and gas, distribution of social amenities and networks, so many things create differences in the total number, uh, total volume of driving by residents. So a prior study again found uh, white, white Hispanic households nationally through about 11,000 we have miles traveled a year versus 9,500. Uh, and then lastly, on multi agency driving, um, we're going to sort of talk about this very simply at first, which is the radius here, but um, the spatial distribution of how close or far you drive is also a factor. So if I just drive here at Chapel Hill, I'm going to get driven differently than all my trips are long distance. The prior study using a different uh, year for the same different vintage of the same data set found that the average travel radius. Of those at or below the poverty level, compared to those making over 100,000 a year, was 10 miles less in Atlanta and Los Angeles, but 15 miles greater in New York, in, uh, uh, New York City. So, you know, like what we're seeing from all these pieces here is that it's location specific. So, we're building a North Carolina estimate specific to our rural um, realities, um, and there can be large differences in these factors to move from residents to farmers. So, putting it all together, 
Um, here's a simplified example. So imagine one group uh, marked in bluish, I guess, on this projector, another red. Moving left to right, standard practice would be to use the people in an area as a residential basis. So that would be both for the city, police department, or the county sheriff. But some of them have access to vehicles. Uh, so that's represented in the second picture by an X, and those might be different by the different groups. Um, in the third picture, imagine those groups that have different volumes. So given you have access, you might have a different amount of volume in the future. So that's represented by an increase in the size of the top. And then lastly, groups drive differently across the agency boundaries, contributing vehicle miles to multiple agencies. So that's the wiggly lines in the form of the top. So now moving away from a simplified example, here's what I actually did. <laughs> so I took um, 6,000 census block group centroids, which is a small area unit for the um, census. We talk about demographics and location of people's residences. And prorated their population, their resident populations, um, using between uh, zero or three of these adjustments. Uh, again, access or and or volume and or multi-jurisdiction driving. And recapture those vehicle miles traveled using a 3,000 point grid. I didn't put them randomly. I just said I want a grid one mile apart and then subset it both North Carolina and then to take them out of the 3,000 points. So I distribute your driving out of the space and look at the difference between your residential point and your are the point, and then use that with the adjustment factors before and next to build um, a grid of all the BMT by race and ethnicity, which I can then recapture and report that into um, city, county law enforcement, which is functional jurisdiction. So the unit analysis then for this first paper um, becomes agency stop rates, and we're going to compare those agency stop rates to each other on mass to see if they're around the same uh, you know, estimate. And then while we model them different ways, we'll watch to see as those estimates are tracked forward um, in the models and how they change over time, how they change as we add more into the model. Um, so if those different agency rates all cluster together or change in the same direction, there's something systematic. So putting it all together, we end up with these nine models, um, which I'll introduce first, and then we'll hit it again in the exact same format data later. Um, so models one and two have no adjustments. So these are just based on residence data. Um, model two is just the same thing as model one, but I'm just translating it into the vehicle model travel space. So I multiply everybody by the same factor on average. Um, so now we're into the vehicle model travel. Now, because I'm going to be using traffic stop rate ratios, that means that I'm multiplying the top and bottom you know, of those two divisors by the same thing. And it ends up being the same disparity measure afterwards. That's why it's um, but then everything else after that is uh, gets an adjustment at some point. Okay, so that's the real data. So um, to get these adjustment factors, I used the National uh, Highway Transportation Survey from 2017 over sampling in North Carolina, which we just looked at with um, some of before. Made reweighting estimates relatively easy from that um, survey. Here's the population survey for North Carolina um, on the left here, uh, and that included about 8,000 households and about 1,700 indigenous. And it's meant to represent the whole state. So here's our first parameter, access. So note that these estimates are different than the national estimates, right? So again, we started with four out of five white and half of black Hispanic households in 2001 nationally. But here in North Carolina in 2017, black households uh, still had less access to vehicles, 85% of black households, um, versus 98% of white and Hispanic households. Now, that's just for comparison to the national estimate from before. The actual number that I use for adjustment is that last column there, which is the any driving during the year estimate, um, which, as a side note, also counts some for um, age. Right? So, like, not every person, not every child can get in a car and drive. So, likewise, the total volume, uh, black drivers drove fewer vehicle miles traveled per year, uh, and those trips were also shorter. Um, we're spreading numbers for other um, reasons that we'll talk about here. And then lastly, instead of inverse distance weighting, so just taking a taking an estimate at a point and then falls off at the inverse square or inverse distance um, as you get far away from it, I wanted to use a custom spatial fallout function that I drive in national survey trips. So we survey every single year it's taken. Um, that lets me then say, um, like, let's look at the a blue, for instance, uh, Hispanic region. So, um, in North Carolina, since North Carolina drivers, uh, uh, Hispanic drivers were farther on average, 
that leads to a lower percent of the total DMT happening in that band. So, you know, this two-dimensional curve represents really a three-dimensional space, and imagine it as a bunch of concentric rings. Each of those rings is a mile. And I want to know how much of your total BNT do I have portion to that ring? And then that ring falls down you know, out to nothing. So it's high here you know, in this row. It's high at zero because basically all of your trips are going to contribute something to that space directly around the residence. Um, but then fewer and fewer you are high. So here's the final results table. Uh, so first, before we even get into a question of what does better measurement do, uh, let's look at just that first line, model one two. So there are baseline disparities even before we start measurement, before we start proving our measurement. So for residential data, again, black and Hispanic residents are pulled over twice the rate, um, at, and Hispanic residents are pulled over four times the rate uh, of white and Hispanic drivers in Florida. Now let's see what happens as we consider a better measurement of that using drivers. Accounting for all three of those parameters, so being down to the third, three factors as a model. Now we see the Hispanic driver disparity didn't change much, but black driver stop rate ratios increased to 2.3 times the white rate instead of two times the white rate. Um, so um, also note that this is calculated again here for black and Hispanic and Hispanic drivers um, because we're organizing other connected to. Um, but for previous research, the American indigenous populations also experienced similar disparities. Um, and since I did calculate adjustment factors, um, for the American populations also, I can say that given those parameters, we expect it to be less than the black non Hispanic increase in experience, but not the near no change um, for Hispanic drivers. So um, those experiences are likely also underestimated. <laughs> so, three punchlines. Disparities are large. Um, dropping small areas means losing some outliers. Um, so, you know, we're looking at um, you know, but, but sort of, you know, I dropped some, uh, actually there was a line earlier, I should have said that I dropped you know, down to 177 agencies. I said every single agency just to make sure rates were more stable. So I want to make sure you have all the years of data for your agency and all these uh, traffic stops. And then, so you can have, and there were very extreme outliers in that smaller data, um, even kind of high in the smaller data. Um, but disparities were large. Um, the driving adjustments can matter. So in this case, um, you know, particularly if we're looking on mass, everyone on mass moved in the same direction. This wasn't, I wasn't trying to do that. Um, that was just a consequence of the model. Um, and uh, lastly, when access, volume, and multi agency driving disparities are in the same direction, right, disparities may be systematic and underestimated. They're not just important, they may underestimate disparities. And, um, you know, that happens partly because of differences with economic status, by race, and other factors. But, um, but in our case, at least for black and Hispanics, um, these are underestimated. The punchline here is that agencies should make some effort to use driving values. Right? Sort of a no-brainer in a way, but it's still not standard values. Okay, on to aim two. So traffic stops are not all the same. North Carolina tracks multiple stop types, so you see the table to the right, which I've grouped into three major categories: moving and safety violations, what I used to think of as a traffic stop because it ran a light or supports that. Uh, economic stops, so that's vehicle regulatory equipment, um, things you don't, things you can just make, um, you know, maintaining a car is a lot easier than that one. And, um, and then lastly, most discretionary stops, so other, uh, investigation, or in this case, seek up, which are highly discretionary stops. And there might be another reason, safety-wise, to do them, but you can do them for uh, And I'm right, you see, in early analysis, I did a Raleigh Police Department stops as an example. So a few things on, on that data, for example. First, if you add the stops by type, um, note that safety stops make up half or less of all stops here in the model. And that's true statewide too. You know, 50, 60, some places less than that. Um, in Fayetteville, where we're at, used to be 33% of stops. So we're moving the safety. Um, that might be used to you as most of me, um, since that's not been my experience in being pulled over and working on this project for obvious reasons. Um, but again, at face value, disparities are higher in economic and discretionary stops in many places than we're here in college. Let's move from Raleigh to Fayetteville. So Fayetteville is the sixth most populous city in North Carolina. Uh, tensions between community groups and police came ahead in 2013, leading to a new police chief, among other changes. That chief, Medlock, uh, voluntarily requested a review of the department by the U.S. Department of Justice. 
documented disparities and traffic stops on that mission. At the same time, as two new members organizing our initial disparities in policing, they will also have one of the highest motor vehicle crash rates in the state. So, what was that? From 2013 to 2016, Chief Medlock reprioritized safety related stops using GPS data to direct stops to more high crash areas and work to change the Bayville Police Constitutional Culture. Uh, in an interview that I did with the police chief, suggested that that also meant restaffing uh, as officers who disagreed with the policy equipped or fired or retained or retrained. So. Um, all that said, the intervention was many things, um, some of which are more quantifiable than others, but it's a mind that you know, we're going to be gesturing at the quantification of that intervention, but it was cultural as well. So there's a few outcomes of interest in this evaluation. First, is there evidence the intervention can happen? Um, so for instance, did the percent of safety stops change? Second, were crashes prevented? So that's fatalities, crash injuries, the total number of crashes, you can talk about that in some ways. Third, did racial disparities decrease? So the percent black of tra all traffic stops as well as the traffic stop rate ratio that we used from version uh, one to And then lastly, did uh, crime increase? And I often put quotes around crime. Um, so two notes on crime um, from this project and other projects have done what we're calling the crime um, so first, what we often call crime are police incidents, right? And that um, can be very important because um, how incidents are captured or not captured, um, not everything is adjudicated that becomes a crime, right? So just kind of keeping in mind the limitations of that. Um, and then second, the Ferguson effect, named after Ferguson, Missouri, is a theoretical increase in violent crime when police, often in response to blowback from a violation of community trust, voluntarily strike or otherwise reduce their output. And the theoretical idea here is that that should lead to an increase in crime because you have to jobs. And that's the first thing. Um, in this case, by relatively de emphasizing discretionary stops that are theoretically used to police for index crimes and violent crimes, um, did crime increase. So, how can we assess this? <laughs> Typical difference in difference methods ask the question for the most broadly. If a place continued at the same trend as it was before the intervention, what's the difference in the post intervention period? So um, in this case for Fayetteville, we compared the post intervention Fayetteville to a theoretical Fayetteville modeled by continuing its trends from the pre-intervention period. Um, uh, where am I? Uh, yeah. Um, but difference in difference requires a parallel trends assumption to sort of gross the model here. The gist is we assume that things are going to continue along the exact same trajectory um, in the post intervention period. For Fayetteville, we don't see it didn't interact um, in an acting intervention. But that's frequently viable. Um, so an example of an unmeasured confounding um, that would sort of break this difference difference assumption um, is that statewide changes like increases in riding post recession happen statewide everywhere, um, economic up and downturns that are more global um, may wrongly attribute the effect of those or the associated um, outcomes of those statewide trends to fade those post intervention effects. And that's not what we want. So control agencies in other cities that also experience those same statewide changes. And help adjust for the, um, those unmeasured confounders. Um, now, a flag for all the many EPIs in the room. Um, notably, in this case, I'm using a, a separate synthetic control model for each measure. And a consequence of that is that it's sort of, um, sort of an uncontrolled, I'm not really adjust, I don't know what I'm controlling for. I don't know what I'm controlling for. I'm just, uh, I have a bunch of controls, and I'm hoping that they control for some unmeasured confounding that's sort of theoretically it's a rationale. Um, but it's a limitation. Um, you know, so, um, Further, the different measures have different confounding factors, right? So I'm looking at many different things, crime and uh, injury outcomes and et cetera, et cetera. And so those data will theoretically look very different. Um, and also, I require more data. I've got literally n equals one here, so we're trying to <laughs> squeeze some juice out of, uh, out of a bit of a rock. I can share more about synthetic um, control resources. Okay, so um, here's a look at our measures through the pre-intervention period for phase bill. And our four control agencies, so eight other large drug balances. A few things to note. Um, first, note the traffic stop rate ratio in the subject of E1. Note that everything is close to two. And that's where we're again sort of in that same high disparity uh, realm for all of these different agencies. Uh, and then second, just to take one measure, which we'll track in the next um, in the next slides. Uh, Fayetteville we'll average 62 fatalities from crashes a year in the pre intervention period. And that's real number, that's not modeled. So here's a, a summary graph of the findings. 
And we're going to go to the uh, actual results in a second just to kind of visualize this. The red dotted line is this synthetic fade bill that I built by waiting a bunch of other agencies to try and match it in the pre intervention period. Um, so then that red line continued without the intervention in the gray area. Right? So I'm hoping the fade bill is going to look like that red line after the intervention period. And what then we're interested in is comparing the blue line to the red line in that gray area during the, during the intervention itself to see how those things change um, once the intervention happens. So we get to those results in the tail. So to summarize, um, the traffic stop profile definitely changed. Um, the number of stops went up dramatically. The percent of safety stops increased dramatically. Um, you know, from the bottom of 33% uh, safety stops up into 90% safety stops, tens of thousands of stops. Um, these aren't small changes. The severity measures both uh, decreased. Um, you know, so for instance, the traffic stop rate ratio moved from 2.5 to 2.2 during the intervention period. That's still pretty high, <laughs> over two, and we'll talk about that in, in the uh, discussion. Uh, there are some wider confidence movies here for a couple of reasons, including small numbers, but the crash outcomes also seem to decrease. So instead of 62 deaths a year in favor of the pre-intervention period, they come down to 48 to 28, uh, and that's the actual unmodeled average during that period of time. Um, for comparison, a synthetic fade bill built from other agencies trying to trend along the same lines are up and uh, are increased in 68. And that's sort of what you'd expect as more driving during the time of life that led to more fatalities and crashes and injuries, and that didn't happen again. Uh, again, small numbers, but suggestive. And then lastly, crime didn't increase even with this uh, reprioritization. So note that a non finding here is kind of suggestive because it also means that. Decreasing the priority of uh, discretionary high disparity traffic stops doesn't decrease crime. And there's evidence to reconsider them as a strategy at all. That's what their goal on paper is, but you're not seeing those kinds of outcomes when you stop it. Because they also have negative effects. Um, so, this is the same results in work form, but in conclusion, the uh, reprioritization of traffic stop types by law enforcement agencies may have a positive public health consequence on uh, both motor vehicle injury and racial security outcomes. While potentially having little negative impact on non traffic crime. Not going to talk about these. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these supplementary analysis, and we'll get into unless there are questions, but this is the personal driving study for being one small spatial area and an alternate intervention effect on industrial use. Again, uh, have to talk about that. So um, we'll do a couple of slides on interpretation and move on to discussion and questions. So, first, um, public health has been called to take an explicit gain of racist perspective. Um, not to ignore or consider racial spirits to be incidental, um, just to document them, but also to act. Critical race theory, and specifically the public health critical race practices, provide a mechanism to critically examine public health work through an anti racist lens. This of racism works, characteristics of white supremacy culture, uh, provide a more community based model, and I think we're confident. These two models inspired my framing for which aim uh, and the discussion, and they include a framework to think about traffic stops. So a very brief um, critical race theory contrasts with a colorblind approach to racism. So for instance, a non-intersectional feminism or a class critique approach to feminism or to, uh, to racism, or a civil rights approach that seeks redress without changing underlying racist structures. Super brief summary of critical race theory. Critical race theory forms the basis for public health critical race practices. This is for American Hindua. See the figure at the right. Um, we're going to put the same figure into the table. So here's that same figure in two lists. We're not going to dig deeply into this whole thing, just about time. Um, but I found this a uh, very workable framework to use and apply to the uh, to my studies. Um, also, find that gender as a social construct has been added by some future articles as in the original but, uh, excuse me, that. So um, PHCRP is contrasted against two models here, uh, and that's based on CRT, provides a dual focus on racism and health. A focus on margins can be applied empirically, accounts for research context, and provides a more ordered process for approaching questions. It's a great thing to have. It's a case like I said, we're doing. So, um, in the dissertation, I have a longer version of this that you know, has each individual uh, focus area, but just a good one. Um, for instance, uh, the conventional approach might suggest that racial barriers are on negative byproducts of uh, traffic stops. Uh, PHCRP approach informed by the primacy of racialization, but acknowledge the central role of policing has had before racialized social control. Traffic stops play a primary role in that um, versus a collapse and collateral damage. Also, more convention. 
I'm not going to go into any more in the slide, but this is also uh, I would also involve a lot of chemical things, characteristics of white supremacy culture. Um, this is my first introduction to anti-racist work back in 2003, and uh, I love it. And the materials are freely available online, so just check them out. Okay, so all that to say, what if we should be done? Uh, in the end, I came up with this visual though to help disentangle the conventional and PHCRP frames for traffic stops. So obviously, again, too detailed to read the slide, but the big picture is levels of action are nested, so individual, interpersonal, institutional, and cultural. So it's a nesting effect in the multi level. Um, and just to pick one, so conventional frames here in gray focus on the individual and interpersonal levels, um, you know, the traffic stop itself, not on institutional and cultural levels of institutional policies and uh, practice. So the nexus of these two sides uh, then is at the traffic stop, but again, conventionally focused on the universal level. Let's see this next one. Just so you can do this. Uh, uh, now, I think it'd be dangerous to use pH therapy to critique some other less enlightened mental framework than say that I have a perfect framework. So I also found it useful to critique the dissertation itself. Um, I have probably too much writing on um, sort of self critique. Uh, but in practice, if you do have a classroom, I think um, I can see PHCRP uses a rubric for teaching studies or designing better studies. Um, I think we've got some real utility issues. Let's finish up on the discussion. So, a few overall points. Um, while quantifying these disparities is relatively recent as a phenomenon, um, too recent really, it's worth noting that black communities in the US have documented these disparities by self publishing the most dangerous jurisdictions to be stopped in since the 1930s. Uh, into uh, that, that in particular practice extends to at least the 1960s. So, why is 2019 we're talking about how many traffic stops? Um, well, accountability. Uh, law enforcement agencies have been privileged to operate with a wide discretion and little to no accountability. You know, like many places have just started measuring traffic stops at all, documenting them on the forms. Um, so, better measurement doesn't guarantee accountability, but can be a useful tool for community organizing. So, just because I've measured some racial disparity doesn't automatically change. The well, second, policing isn't the only available intervention for these public health and public safety outcomes. So there are other evidence-based ways to reduce motor vehicle fatalities, uh, ones that don't have the same relationship with the justice system and disparities to marginalized communities. So the faithful study shouldn't be interpreted out of that context as evidence for increased policing because policing can save lives. Uh, there's other competing uh, interventions there we're considering. Moreover, incremental reductions in disparities, like we saw in Fayetteville, are not necessarily a pathway to no disparities. Um, so, you know, we, we should have a little more of this intervention if we get down to, you know, we got down to two, uh, twice the rate, but remembering on what are these things. And then lastly, in the spirit of Black Lives Matter more broadly, is we're asking whether a death from a motor vehicle crash is given to see prevention resources at a homicide or the prevention of property crime. How do we distribute resources? Does that matter? Um, and it's likewise important to consider whether low income communities and communities of color disparately bear the burden of certain public health interventions. Evidence based or not, like the sea called saturation control, which are evidence based. So, this, uh, this collection of studies has some strengths and benefited from a wider team of collaborators. Uh, there's some practical applications here, which are the use strength. Um, there's some applications of useful theory, PHCRP, and interpretation discussion, but a lot more can be done there. Um, and that theory might be useful in popular education approaches around traffic stop organizing. <laughs> And two in particular may benefit from its more harm reduction approach to disparities. You can do something, maybe try to do this instead of that. Um, but uh, you know, that also has limitations. Um, so first, on the measurement side, um, because the method relied on NHCS, which is not yet oversampled for all states, the method from A1 doesn't scale nationally by itself. Now, I have ideas, and I decided on how to do that. Uh, on A1, also, the um, custom distribution functions beat inverse distance weighting, but it's still unidirectional, which is not how we drive. You don't just drive in all directions indiscriminately. Um, so there's also no modeling of state high control or place of uh, specific agencies, um, but that can also be done. Um, officers ascribe the race and ethnicity of drivers, which has all the problems you can think of and more. Um, there's evidence of officers intentionally tampering with this data in other states to reduce report disparities. Among other problems of self identification versus other identification cases. Uh, lastly, on this list, anyway, aim two, uh, synthetic control will benefit from more data uh, and more critical thinking about confounding, not just waving my hands and control. I measure confounding, which I think is probably you know, reasonable, but also. Um, uh, 
Uh, so it's the next steps. Again, the method of using this paper doesn't scale um, because NHGS is only overset for some states. I also explored, maybe some of slides, uh, license registration data, employer travel data from the two loads, ACS data and three tables. None really worked. Um, so the best bet would be uh, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics Local Area Transportation Characteristics for Households Latch Survey, um, which basically turns the survey from NHTS into a model to then do a better job of small area estimation across the country. And that might scale to doing better driving denominators at a small area level by race ethnicity nationwide. Okay. On stop rates and stop types, previous studies like many Franks have documented uh, wide variations. But what drives those variations between agencies? So do economic stops near poverty rates at the ecological level? Do safety stops near crashes at the ecological level? Um, are they largely unrelated agency to agency, which would be important to know? Those are useful ecological questions. The uh, PHCRP informed traffic stop diagram might be useful um, in teaching about this, uh, thinking about multi-level uh, traffic stop consequences. Might be a graphical kind of consistent touch point model stop could lead to this, could lead to this, could lead to this, and what the studies and, and support for those um, should also might be useful. I'd like to systematically break RTI star. So <laughs> um, it's a pretty fragile method. So for instance, I could simulate data and there's, and there's a tool online to do this to, to test your agency using uh, that RTI. And I can just pass it a bunch of simulated data and then watch my pass the test over. So, uh, I had a whole drop game around some agency neighborhoods in Fayetteville. I think that. And lastly, I'd like to continue um, support of the Open Data Policing website, which here in North Carolina has historically been used in court to substantiate things of individual officer racial bias and between agencies and all of the law. Um, so getting, getting the data out there can have real consequences for me. So, beyond more traditional research, the community coalitions I work with advocate for a dozen or so action steps, but here's just three. Uh, expensive citations, no insurance or bad equipment, or like bank They further criminalize poverty at the individual and neighborhood level. Some cities end or reduce these stops of traffic, uh, these types of traffic stops entirely, or forgiveness programs to drop those fees entirely. That's the uh, increased accountability in infrastructure for agencies. So, for instance, the North Bay and I've talked about before. One would turn like to advocate for GPS data on this form, which you have, um, and some agencies keep it for many dollars. Uh, and lastly, structural changes. So, as an example, we can look to the overdose epidemic, which has historically been whiter and treated even more fairly than previous wars on drugs. Um, you know, public health, mental health, community of loss prevention, built driving, and pedestrian infrastructure initiatives um, may work better than funding police operating in every sector. Um, so, more evidence and advocacy there to reduce the traffic, uh, the scope creep, policing seems to be useful. So, that's it. Thank you so much. That was a really, really excellent presentation. And I'm really like glad that this work is coming out of this department. I think public health should be doing more work like this. Um, and I have one question, but before that, I want to encourage you to bring this work to epidemiology audiences. There was a, um, I don't know if you were at SER a couple weeks ago, but yes, the, um, there was a critical race theory symposium this year at SER. So there's sort of a, I think the big epidemi organizations are starting to be more open to ideas like these. And I think if you wanted to think about a symposium around criminal justice epi, for example, I think that would be really well received um, by uh, an executive board. Um, which um, <laughs> we can talk. Anyway, so, um, so uh, I would encourage you to really think about that because I think that epidemiology can do a lot more about the issues. And like this work is a way to do that. And then I had a question, sort of a method y question. That's not shocking, I guess. That's right. Um, which is that in the main analysis, uh, just in A1, sorry, in the main analysis of A1, I, I did not see whether or not you did age adjustment. Um, did you do age adjustment of some kind or another? Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, not directly. There would be some control of that by the fact that the percent of drivers who have 
um, is based on each specific data. For sure. So that number is going to be a little bit different, um, yeah. but not. I mean, and the other challenge I mean, is that there's no localized age adjustment at all as I'm applying this to Fayetteville versus Raleigh versus yeah. this is yeah. statewide adjustment. So yeah. um, there's at least a couple limitations there. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, the related yeah, point that might be worth thinking about for future work is you listed these sorts of three access, volume, and multi agency. Um, axes over which you, you sort of think accounted for. There's a, I think, I, I could be completely wrong here, but I think that there's an interesting competing risks problem here because of the over incarceration of um, black men in particular. And so, if you, and, and, and things less than incarceration, like getting your license. Here. And so, you have this censoring problem where the more times you're stopped, the more likely you are to lose your license, the less likely you are driving. In an extremely informative way to hide some of the actual disparity. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And like that's a thing that it is very hard to measure, obviously. But if you have in those data people losing their licenses, and that might be public information, then that's a thing you could start to account for as a missing data problem. And I think that the way that that will play out is that these numbers underestimate the disparity because you're not seeing people who are incarcerated and so aren't driving. But if they were, they'd be overstocked for exactly the same reason. Like, and those two things are deeply related. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, think, I, I expect to talk about this during closed session in particular, but gender is a serious <laughs> intersectional question here. Yeah. Um, and not one that I'm too away from this analysis and knowing it's a major Um uh, Frank's work separates out often um, race and gender, and we know that you know, consequence. Um, Outcomes such as arrests, etc., are specifically around black men more so than black women, but also. Um, so, uh, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, I'm also using one point in time to estimate all of time. There's, <laughs> you know, I'm hoping this is the beginning, it's totally better incrementally, um, but yeah, those are all great points. I think this is a real thing. Um, so, yeah. thanks. Thank you. This is just a small question. Um, so you mentioned the way race is categorized. Is that race okay. is categorized? So who does that? And can you explain the black and non Hispanic group and how that works? Yeah, um, they are. So um, so I got police codes. On a form, SBI 122 from the state, we've got a separate box with four choices for race, for race and Hispanic or non Hispanic. That's it. Or ethnic um, And so the combination, so um, the reason I'm intentionally separating out black and non Hispanic as my comparison category um, was in this case, you know, the, if you think about the, sort of the consequences of um, comparing Hispanic to non Hispanic, comparing um, black to white, including Hispanic, why not the white Hispanic group in there? Is it deflates both disparity comparisons? And so, you know, like white Hispanics and white non Hispanics don't have the same experience according to this data. Um, so that's my rationale for making that which I'm an artificial distinction. Um, and then also, like uh, this particular form is not based on census definition, which are also probably flawed, but you know, this is a form from 20 years ago. Yeah. I would assume that they use the driver license and stuff pull out my space. Yeah, let's talk about that. So yeah, <laughs> I was gonna have everyone pull the driver's license. Um, so almost every driver's license is gonna have a blank for that um, race ethnicity category for race category in your driver's license. It was not required, it's not required to you. Um, there's been previous studies of how blank that is statewide. Otherwise, I'd love to use that. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I couldn't use the driver's license. Um, it was put on the form in order to um, do a better job of accounting for particularly the Native American drivers. Um, so that, if, if you're Native American, you might have something in that field. But I don't have anything in that field. And most people don't have anything in that field. And in conversations with state DOT, they're like, we have no race on this thing, basically, um, on licensures. And linkage to registration data also is like, like, no, you can't have a demonstration. I mean, you know, it's a privacy safety thing we talked about for a while. So, I would just say that the last time North Carolina revised the traffic crash form was over 30 years ago. 
And um, the good news is we are getting ready to make a series of revisions to it um, because of the need to go with e-crash, e e-report. Um, so those computers that carry around in their cars don't do anything to report in crash. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so crashes we have at the very particular point level. We have basically no point level data for crashes. We have an agency. We don't know where the driver came from. You know, so you know, Chad mm -hmm. gets to say we pulled over a black guy from somewhere. Yeah. And that's about as much data as we have on the yeah. form. But there's no reason because we can have other forms that are much older that have geo you can easily put the where this was. You know, um, and if you go back 20 years, there are no Hispanic crashes. In yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the reality. Because there was no code for Hispanic. So Highway Safety Research Center um, is redoing the is in charge of the e-filing project. So it's your chance to have in into this. Uh, no, no, no. Very much a rally level process. All that implies. So we use the word <laughs> process in the most broadest term possible. <laughs> next question. Yeah. I'm just wondering about the next So if so if it says black non Hispanic, I know how that can misclassify moving people from one group to the other, but you only talked about how that would move people from either black or Hispanic to white category, but you can also move them to this, you know. We should display both of those as Spanish. Right. Yeah. So you don't really know that your final measurement. The, I, would, I wouldn't know the effect for, I wouldn't know the sort of sub, sub, smaller effects, right? So these are not entirely arbitrary, but um, imperfect distinctions. And you're right, like the example that I gave was um, from, the, from the deflation of the uh, Hispanic versus non Hispanic effect, right? So then I'd be comparing Hispanics uh, against the um, against black non-Hispanics, which make the bulk of people who identify as black. Um, and that will shrink that disparity compared to white non-Hispanics, which broadly receive a very easy treatment. Um, that's all the Asian population. And, and the key answer to your question is that it's filled out by the officer. And if they see a black person, they're not Hispanic. Yeah, so I, it's yeah. filled out by the officer. And so Matt, Matt, I mean, statistically in the data, it's on the blacks. And people reported as black, 98% of them are not as bad. Some very, very high yeah. yeah, which is again also common. You know, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing a top of the offers just a description of Hispanic and then often the description of this at the same time. Thank you. Although that's interesting to the extent that we construe race in terms of the interpersonal perceptions, right? Because it did. Which is not, which is part of your story, but not the yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but even that interpersonal perception is probably affected by issues. Absolutely, right? absolutely. A person can pass here and they wouldn't pass in Texas as the same other ascribed reasons. Right. Uh, anyway, there's like there might be something interesting you're thinking about in, in that that perception is is it's it's not the exact construct you're interested in. But it's a really interesting and important concept. It's different constructs, right? It's the, it's the, it's the jurisdiction-specific, individual-officer-specific description of race right. and then all the privileges. I mean, again, like a lot of these stops aren't really happening because they identify an individual person as a driver. They're happening at the neighborhood level also, right? Yeah. So not, yeah. it's like, you know, it's really about the description of race ethnicity at the neighborhood level mm -hmm. and how we treat neighborhoods differently, yeah. as well as individual description of individual, you know, your personal description. I started late, but it is now awesome. My question for you is about your name, too. I'm curious, how did you decide to control Yeah, great. There's some limitations to synthetic control, which you can talk about just a little bit. Um, which will have consequences there too. But basically, I looked at the top 15 cities, and I think I ended up whittling it down to those that complete data. Um, I think it ended up being the top nine cities. Facebook had the sixth most populous city by population. Um, that then has some consequences for similarities in their driver network and 
you know, the size of the police department, and you know, a bunch of other things that were broadly enough have some control for. Um, once those, um, once those controls are selected, synthetic control is a mathematical way of figuring out, um, you know, this is a, these are the agencies across the top, and these are the weights in the thing to produce individual synthetic control comparisons. Um, so what synthetic control is basically doing is a linear combination and best match of that pre interaction group. So a problem with that, though, is that if you have a very particularly outlier hard to match element that can't be constructed by the linear combination of your other controls, you've got a problem. Again, I have one agency doing this over time. I've got time, but I've got one agency. And um, you know, this, this technique is great for much smaller than you've got 20 you know, things and a million controls, you're gonna find the right control to generate a special control. But for instance, let's look at um, like the percent um, black non-Hispanic stops. I'm just matching to Durham. <laughs> it's like the worst match because um, Bank of Delta has a much higher, one of the highest percent black non-Hispanic in the state. And so it is no linear combination of any of the, you know, there's no way to deflate to it and just time properly. Um, so again, yeah, that happened. That part happens mathematically after I pick sort of top ten cities, and then I hope that I get some control of that. Uh, another, I mean, again, I'm getting this sort of post-session some, but another thing I could have done would have been to build a traffic stop match and a measures of traffic proximity match, try to cluster more things at the same time, match more things out of um, And that's you know, you can use a data to then do this to say I want you to match on these and give me estimates of these things. It's, it's, you know, been suggested for the analogy test. Um, in my case, not knowing the defined relationship across all of these measures, I'm offering it with that limitation. Um, but yeah, there's other ways to combine them. And with more data, you can have some more flexibility to say, I want these covariates, and I want these outcomes. In this case, I'm matching my outcome measure, and let's see the um, let's see what happens. And what field is this primarily coming out of? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a difference in different econometrics part um, of it, and there's some really great um, synthetic control of epidemiology papers now, you know, for for very public health centered interventions. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, student crime. I mean, I think it's a uh, you know relatively new to me, I would say. Um, you know, some of the central papers for it are like, I mean, two, early 2000s, 2010 now. I think that's sort of popular the last few years with some things like that, but. Um, it's cool. Any more? Thank you. So, dissertation committee will take a few minutes break here and we'll bring forward.